uh, good morning everyone a very warm welcome to all of you to this awareness uh, uh, webinar on new consumer protection act 2019 uh, unfortunately we were waiting uh, for uh, for honorable minister to join uh, but since he hasn't joined it we will begin the proceeding and and uh, invite him in between uh, so uh, uh, we have today an excellent set of panel uh, with us uh, uh, who are expert from different different uh, sectors and areas and they would be sharing uh, perspective from their end on the uh, new consumer protection act 2019 and how how it so far has been the experience after its implementation and uh, to to begin the session let me invite mr mohit sardana who is the managing director of swadharma corporate international private limited uh, as well as co chair of uh, a uh, fikiri as committee uh, uh, to give opening remarks uh, mr sardana uh, namaste one and all as i extend my welcome i wish each one of you and your family health and safety on behalf of fikki i would like to thank our panel of esteemed speakers for being with us today illuminate us on the important topic of cpa 2019 consumer protection act 2019 friends india being rich in minerals human resource and wisdom since time unknown has been at the zenith when we talk of trade we were the most vibrant economy on the planet of course consumer protection had been an integral part of governance for ages the quantum of importance it holds is evident of its mention in atharva veda that nobody should be involved in mal practices of quality and measurement our honorable prime minister shri narendra modi ji in his address at the international conference on uh, consumer protection first event of its kind in south asia made a very clear statement that protection of consumer interest is the priority of the government this is also reflected in our resolution of the new india moving beyond consumer protection new india will have the best of consumer practices and consumer prosperity a corollary to caveat emptor and that consumer is the king we have the new cpa 2019 we have the new consumer protection act 2019 which came into force last year replacing the previous enactment of 1986 this has strengthened consumer rights by making the manufacturers sellers wholesalers retailers direct sellers e-com players any and every kind of suppliers more accountable than ever before also it provides a crystal clear operandi which shall assist the buyer in availing services and purchase from the sellers that innocent buyer is not swindled by the imposters and fraud business setups non adherence to any provision of the new act calls for penalty and punishment this will ensure just and fair transactions enhancing faith in businesses which shall lead to rapid growth and escalating profits in the respective sector uh in this webinar uh, we have a clan of uh, like minded economic pioneers and a matter of immense honor we'll be having shri kadam state minister for food civil supplies and consumer protection government of maharashtra he'll be guiding us and supporting us his urge to accelerate the growth of corporates as it clearly defines the happiness index of his people uh it will be very evident from his presence here shortly uh his office has already logged in we are looking forward for his presence and look we look forward for his pat on our back and support uh madam saluda sulaja the chairperson for uh, fikki chapter maharashtra was supposed to join for the formal address for the formal welcome but somehow last moment changes she is not able to join so let me uh, do the formal honors uh, on behalf of fikki a uh, very warm welcome to all the speakers 
and delegates who have joined today's webinar here on this platform as well as on YouTube. Uh, this morning, I got a call from my Fiki office that the response is overwhelming. Our Zoom room is full to its capacity. So we had to switch on an alternate platform for uh, the uh, audience increasing in numbers by every minute. So today uh, we have come together to create more awareness about the new act, Consumer Protection Act 2019, uh, which was implemented last year in 2020. So this uh, online event is going to cover all salient features and uh, shall enlighten the participants, the consumers in the room uh, to help them protect their rights. As the execution of the new tools made available uh, to the consumer for the protection of their rights will be done by the state government. That is how uh, we are delighted and honored that we have with us the dynamic leader, the minister, Dr. Kadam. So he'll be joining uh, with us very shortly. Uh, indeed, it's a privilege uh, that we'll be having him on board. So I would also like to thank Srimati Nishat Haq, head for the department, think, nudge, and move department. Think, nudge, and move department, BIS Government of India, for agreeing to be the part of this event. And we welcome your participation, madam, to discuss the viewpoint of Bureau of Indian Standards on this act. I welcome all the senior industry experts who have joined this webinar to share their experience so far, especially in these challenging times of pandemic and the way forward. As some of you would be aware, this law, this particular act introduced several new concepts, including the establishment of a new body called CCPA, Central Consumer Protection Authority, and this has got wide pass. The new act introduces a unique provision for protection of consumers against unfair practices, and much more, much more. This act also covers e-commerce and direct selling transactions, and stringent provisions have been let down for the product liability. So Fiki, as you know, has always played a very important role by offering inputs of the industry to the government. When this act was being framed, I'm delighted to understand that many of the suggestions made by Fiki were accepted by the government, considering that the act has introduced many more salient future features and concepts. So it is very important for all the stakeholders to understand the act. We hope with this event this morning, we'll be able to educate the consumers. And I'm glad to share, we have a very wonderful participation of consumers uh, on this platform and this webinar. We have stakeholders, we have everybody to make us understand and interpret the CPA in its full perspective. So we'll be discussing a lot many things, uh, CDRC, mediation, product liability, penalties, and much more. Uh, FIKI uh, over the years has been actively focusing on curbing the problem of growing illicit trade uh, and uh, counterfeit goods under its cascade initiative. Counterfeit products is an issue that affects consumers, businesses, brands, as well as the whole market sentiments. We hope that the government, law enforcement, and the industry will be able to collaborate and work towards creating robust mechanism to guard against the menace of spurious products. Uh, lately, uh, machine learning and automated systems have been trying to ensure that only authentic products are sold through digital marketplace, through e-commerce platforms. This is to avoid any challenges that may face under the act. Therefore, it is very important that we understand the challenges of misleading claims and act on offenders to save the rights and serve our consumers for a rewarding experience. So I was not supposed to offer such long keynote, but I'm covering the part of our chairperson, Madam Sulaja. So I beg your pardon for being that lengthy with my keynote, so with my opening speech. So with these few words, uh, I'll stop here 
and look forward to hearing our esteemed panelists and guests on the subject. And I hope that participants will get to benefit out of these discussions. So uh, they say, uh, wisdom majorly comes of experience and farsightedness. Trading further, I request Srimati Nishat Hak from the Beauty of Indian Standards to shed some light on the new act. Srimati Hak heads the department called the Think, Nudge and Move Department with BIS Government of India. Madam Hak, please. Ma'am, you're on mute. You're on mute, madam. Good morning. Good morning to all the participants, our uh, distinguished uh, panelists, uh, and uh, the key office bearers. So today uh, we will be discussing the new Consumer Protection Act 2019, a law brought in to ensure the consumer welfare and protection. Uh, I would like to share a short presentation. Is it visible? Yes, it's visible now. Maybe you can do a full screen. So we have been uh, hearing about the Consumer Protection Act. So it has certain uh, uh, bodies under it, uh, which will help it to implement the act. So we have the uh, three councils. Basically their role is advisory. So the Central uh, Consumer Protection Council, it is uh, chaired by the minister in charge of the Department of Consumer Affairs uh, at the center. So that is Piyush Boilji at present. Uh, the state council uh, is chaired by the uh, honorable minister of the state, respective state, handling the charge of consumer affairs. So uh, I think uh, you have targeted uh, uh, Dr. Kadam with this uh, intention. And then the Consumer Protection Councils at the district level, they are chaired by the uh, district collector. Now the new authority which has been formed uh, under the CPA is the Consumer Protection Authority that is uh, also called as the Central Authority. So we will be discussing a bit about the uh, functions of this authority uh, because uh, uh, the investigating uh, investigation uh, part is under the uh, CCPA. Uh, we also have the commissions at the national, state, and district level. Now, the role of the uh, Central Consumer Protection Council, uh, it is well laid down in the Act. So, it will enforce, it will uh, protect, prom promote, and enforce the rights of the consumer as a class. So here the important uh, aspect is the class. Uh, so that, that is a very big power which is given to the Central Consumer Protection Authority. In addition to that, it will prevent unfair trade practices. Uh, it will also target the false or misleading advertisement. And also the person uh, who take part in such uh, misleading uh, or false advertisements. So this all is envisaged in the section 18 of the act. Now, uh, under the act, uh, it has been given powers under the section 18. So one of the powers under section 18.2 is to inquire or cause an inquiry or investigation to be made into violations of rights of unfair trade practices. So this it can do either so motto 
based on the information that may be available uh, through various fora, uh, maybe the National Consumer Helpline, maybe newspaper, or any other <clears throat> any other uh, information, or it can uh, work on a complaint received on it, or also from the directions from the central government. So oh, the, these are the uh, 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 available uh, provisions of the section 90. It will uh, uh, see whether there is any prima facie case of uh, violation of consumer rights. And in case it is satisfied that there is a prima facie case, it can either take up investigation itself or get it done from the director general or by the district collector. So uh, here is where the role of Bureau of Indian Standards comes in, uh, because Director General Bureau of Indian Standards has been appointed as the Director General Investigation under CCPA. So this is the provision under Section 15 of the Act uh, that the Central Authority shall have an investigation wing headed by a director general and the director general will act as directed by the central authority. So uh, the director general is not empowered to take cognizance or uh, start uh, something so motto or accept a complaint and start investigation uh, on receipt of complaint directly from the consumer. It is always the CCPA which would be referring the complaint to Director General Bureau of Indian Standards at present to conduct an inquiry. Uh, the investigation wing, uh, as per the provision of section, section 15 of the Act, will consist of other office bearers also, namely the ADG, Additional Director General, Director, Joint Director, Deputy Director, and Assistant Director. So their uh, experience and uh, qualifications also uh, do matter. They have been given certain powers and the uh, exercise of powers is also defined. Uh, the CPA says that the inquiries of the investigation, which are made by the director general, they have to be submitted to the central authority in a form, manner, and time, which will be specified by regulations. Uh, this is the present setup of the investigation wing. Uh, the additional secretary, the Department of Consumer Affairs, is the chief commissioner of uh, CCPA. Joint secretary, Department of Consumer Affairs, Ministry of Consumer Affairs is the commissioner. Uh, Director General Investigation, as I told you, is DGBIS. Additional Director General Investigation is the Director General of National Test House. We also have uh, around 46 Director Investigations. Uh, they are the Deputy Director Generals of each of the five regions of BIS, the director, Deputy Director General of the Laboratories, and heads of the 32 BIS branch offices and eight laboratories of BIS. The Joint Director, uh, there are six joint directors. Uh, they all come from the national test halls. So here I would like to tell you that uh, Bureau of Indian Standards uh, is having a pan-India presence. And uh, uh, we are the national standards body and also have uh, our conformity assessment schemes. Uh, one is a very well-known ISI mark scheme that you would be aware of. Another scheme is the hallmarking scheme for the gold and silver jewelry and artifacts. And uh, in, in a few years back, we also launched the self-declaration of conformity scheme. That is the registration scheme for electronics and solar goods. So uh, in order to su supplement these conformity assessment schemes, we have a well laid down complaint handling mechanism. Uh, and also an enforcement wing in BIS. So uh, uh, the complaints that are received in BIS, uh, I mean, till now, 
uh, under were under the are under the Bureau of Indian Standards Act 2016. So the investigation of the complaint is uh, done to establish the genuineness of the complaint. And complaint investigation uh, is done at the complainant end, at the BIS licensee end, the holder of BIS license, or the manufacturer end. And more recently, uh, due to the changes in the marketplace, uh, also with the e-commerce website, uh, maybe the warehouses, and all other such places where uh, uh, evidence can be collected. Uh, under the BIS Act, uh, in case of the misuse of BIS standard mark, we have also been carrying out uh, very successful enforcement raids, that is the search and seizure for the collection of evidence. So uh, with that experience uh, uh, and with the provision of the uh, CCP, uh, uh, sorry, the Consumer Protection Act, so the responsibility that is uh, there with the Director General for the investigation. So we expect that we would be discharging that responsibility. So under section 22, uh, there is the power of search and seizure. So which states that for the purpose of conducting an investigation after preliminary inquiry, the Director General or any other officer authorized on his behalf or the district collector. So uh, of course we will be applying the part pertaining to Director General as the case may be, if he has a reason to believe that any person has violated any consumer rights. So he, he uh, or the other uh, uh, violations uh, as per the CPA, they have the right to enter at any reasonable time into such premises and search for any document or record or article or any other form of evidence and seize it. Uh, they are also required to make a note and inventory of such record or article and require any person to produce any record, register or other documents. Uh, as far as the uh, uh, provisions of the PIS Act, we have also been drawing samples uh, for carrying out the testing at BIS or BIS recognized labs to establish uh, whether the product is meeting the specified requirements. So in this case also the uh, authority for the article is provided. So the BIS can also draw the product as part of the evidence. Uh, for the search and seizure, the provisions of the Code of Criminal Procedure uh, relating to the provisions of the search and seizure, they will apply. And that uh, BIS has already the experience of doing this uh, under the BIS uh, Act, wherein there is a collection of evidence, uh, preparation of seizure memo, listing of goods, description, and all the uh, evidence, documents, photographs are collected. And this, this forms an uh, investigation report. Based on these documents, uh, BIS has uh, been filing the cases under the uh, BIS Act with the respective court. So basically we expect that under the CC, uh, under the Consumer Protection Act, uh, BIS would be receiving the complaint from CCPA uh, at the Director General Investigation End. Uh, we have a separate cell, the Central Consumer Protection Authority Coordination Cell, uh, which will be handling the flow of the uh, complaint and investigation at BIS. Uh, from there, the uh, complaint will be assigned to the relevant director investigation amongst the 46 directors. Investigation will take place uh, as per the complaint at the consumer end, at the manufacturer, seller, e-commerce, maybe the warehouse. So depending on the complaint, uh, investigation will take place and uh, evidence will be collected. If required, certain seizure operations would also be carried out. 
and if required samples would be drawn for investigation or testing so that the uh, genuineness or the complaint uh, can be established so based on all these documents uh, an investigation report uh, would be prepared and this would be submitted to the ccpa through proper channel so these documents would uh, involve the preliminary investigation report certain seized uh, uh, documents evidences collected at that time uh, other photographs test reports all those things and these will be sent to the ccpa now ccpa uh, is the authority uh, which has the powers to take the further actions based on the outcome of investigation ccpa may initiate the actions it may enforce recall reimbursement return of unsafe products goods or services and imposition of penalties as per the provisions of cpa 2019 so uh, this is in short the role that uh, eis uh, would be undertaking uh, at this point i would like to uh, thank fiki for uh, taking up this awareness program because we have been uh, uh, like very uh, uh, like active in making the consumers aware of uh, the consumer protection act but unless all the players in the market are made aware of these provisions uh, the implementation of the act would not be that successful so thank you that i like my presentation Uh, thank you, Madam, for this uh, informative presentation. Uh, I just got informed by my colleague, Mr. Deepak from uh, Maharashtra, that uh, the minister is uh, late, uh, keeping uh, in view his uh, busy schedule. So he'll be joining us shortly. We are expecting, uh, keeping uh, the ball rolling. The generation next, exuberant and ringing in the novelties of interpretation. of the plr chambers a very well known law firm specializing in public policy and regulatory affairs mr aditya rao partner plr chambers is here to here with us to share the salient features and provisions of the new cpa 2019 mr aditya rao thank you mr sadana uh, firstly a very good afternoon to all the fellow panelists and uh, also to all the uh, i would say unexpectedly huge number of attendees uh, i think that by itself as mr sadana said and i would second that uh, evinces the uh, amount of interest that exists uh, in this area um, mr sadana when you started out i think uh, you covered a whole lot of uh, the salient features uh, and therefore have already encroached on some parts but i am going to try and do justice on uh, speaking about some of the non obvious nuances uh, that exist within uh, the current act and i would like to start by saying that uh, the shift that you see from the 1986 act to uh, the the current act that is before us and it's still an evolving animal we must note that uh, states uh, have to come out with rules uh, a lot of the process has to be set in place but some of the nuanced components of this is really going to be as mr sadana said in his opening statement going to be game changing and i think this is going to also augment behavior with respect to both the consumer as well as the regulator as well as the companies itself consumer protection law till now we was looked at from a slight grievance redressal angle only the concept of in, in evolving standards the concept of looking at practices the concept of looking at representations is something that has now come to the fore and why has that come to the fore that has come to the fore because over the last couple of decades when india has looked at liberalization 
right? And the augmented waves of development that we have seen in the recent past. You have seen an explosion of who you would refer to as the consumer. So without further ado, what I'm going to do is uh, run you through some of the key concepts within the act and uh, what does it mean? Uh, one of the things that uh, Madam Huck very pertinently pointed out is the term consumer rights. Now consumer rights has now been put front and center with respect to uh, this particular act and it actually finds mention uh, I wanted to put everybody's attention and call it out to show that consumer rights now is not an ambiguous concept. To quite the contrary, the six items that you see here are actually being the central pivot for the purposes of enforcement, for the purposes of review of what should be done. And to my mind, actually act as a, if you may, a super preamble or a guiding principle for this act, which is going to hold us in good stead. What does it talk about? It talks about protection against goods and services, which are hazardous. You are looking at the right to be informed, both of qualitative as well as quantitative items with respect to goods, products or services. Being assured, and we will come back to this, and access to a wide variety of good products or services at competitive prices. And then you have the right to be heard and to be assured that a consumer interest will receive due consideration at appropriate fora. Seek redressal against unfair trade practices or unscrupulous exploitation of customers and consumer awareness. Now these are what I would refer to as the Magna Carta of what the law is looking to enforce. Now, what are some of the key concepts that have come through, right? So the key concepts that have come through is that the definition of, of consumer, as some would say it, has been widened. Now, explicitly, consumer uh, includes anyone looking at purchase of any goods, uh, products, or, or services uh, bought via any mode. So online mode and offline mode, including deferred payment. You have the concept of unfair contract. Now the concept of unfair contract is very, very interesting. And it's a bit of a um, explored domain, if you may. But uh, there, the act basically is looking into also the examination of how is it that the customer's consent is brought through, especially when you're looking at mass goods. And it is bringing scrutiny right in front and center on the nature of the contracts that are entered into. There is an obligation by way of uh, uh, you know, product liability, by way of the various components of right representations that, that are that are manufacturer, trader, and everybody in the entire supply chain has to be aware of where we are now bringing in the concept of a adequate diligence being conducted by the trader, the concept of unsafe goods. You have the concepts of defect, uh, either implied or those that are claimed by the trader. The manufacturer is now in the front and center uh, with the widened and explicit definition of the entire focus of the act. Product liability has found an express mention. It, as Mr. Sardana correctly said, includes almost everybody who has a participation in the supply chain vis-a-vis -a, -vis a particular good or service. How this is going to play out? How is the council or the various dispute resolution mechanisms put out going to pin liability or for particular defective products for deficiency in services is something that is uh, yet to be seen. But I think product liability is one of the very, very important pillars that has been brought in. Uh, Madam Huck actually talked about the uh, CCPA. One of the items that I that I really want to bring focus on is these two buckets mentioned right next to each other. One 
is the CCPA's mandate to also look at measures for effective implementation for safeguards under various laws. So CCPA could necessarily look at consumer protection as a supra domain and come up with tenets for consumer protection, basis, obligations, and other laws as well. Now, this is an area where we will have to wait and watch uh, and see what the CCPA fin finally comes up with. Uh, it also has to take into consideration factors that inhibit consumer rights and remedial measures. Now, this to my mind is very, very important because regulatory attention is being called to the fore with respect to looking at what are the hurdles that are being created? What are the mechanisms that are being deployed with respect to implementation and effective enforcement or recognition of consumer rights? and remedial measures towards that. So I think it goes way beyond just paper implementation and companies, manufacturers, traders who are uh, taking the gold standard in consumer protection are going to benefit from uh, the current regime. You've already heard Madam Huck in her references to talk about the role of the district collector. This becomes important because the district collector is actually going to become your first arm of implementation, so to speak, if effectively deployed. Uh, what's, what's important to note is that the district collector has been given a wide array of powers in respect of looking at complaints on unfair trade practices and actually submitting her or his findings back to the, uh, to the regional authority or to the central authority. Is there a possibility of class action? Is there a possibility of big data class action? What do I mean by class action? By class action lawsuits, I mean, is there a probability of a large number of consumers coming together? Um, and, and the act has sufficient hooks and levers uh, to be able to enable that specifically on electronic intermediaries, e-commerce platforms. Uh, my co-panelist, uh, Mr. Nishant, will elaborate on that. But uh, the kind of uh, levers that this act attaches in terms of disclosure, in terms of product quality, in terms of assurances and transparency with respect to marketing, um, I think is going to be a bit of a game changer for electronic intermediaries in how the entire online sale is looked at. And mind you, this is not just an e-commerce play. E-commerce reference very quickly brings about some of the popular websites that we use or our apps on our phones. But a large number of manufacturers, a large number of traders, a large number of service providers are also doing what we call D2C, direct to customer sales, on their own platforms. It, this law has equal imp, uh, implications for them as well. And I think the shift has started to happen. Uh, with with the, the new law, there also comes a risk of what are the kind of potential disruptions that one can see. You can look at asymmetric compensation coming out uh, because today uh, we have very few or or close to none benchmarks uh, with respect to what is the kind of compensation that needs to be provided. In some cases, the scale can move from 1x to 2x to 3x to 4x. This causes a bit of unpredictability uh, for, with, with respect to uh, those that are on the receiving end of consumer complaints. It provides a bit of unpredictability and passes on burden onto litigants as well, which are consumers, uh, you can have the small firm effect. What do I mean by that in combination with product distortions is that since this is untested areas, you may have smaller or fringe players uh, taking unilateral action and that causing the authority uh, to put out uh, or, or the respective uh, state functionaries to put out instructions, guidelines, uh, which finally impact the overall ecosystem 
in a in a in a not so efficient manner and resulting in what we would call as regulatory overreach now all of this becomes pertinent because as i said again the time to scale from the notification of the act to where we are today uh there is a significant amount of passage of time and we are yet to see almost all the states come out with the rules uh and look at some of these items and i think it's important for consumer groups for citizens at large for manufacturers or uh you know sellers or traders as well as the regulator to start considering this um uh, these potential disruptions and start making appropriate measures towards that what are the items that you need to consider and i've i've tried to do a divide between what should be uh something that uh the the sellers or the providers of goods services uh should should actually look at and what the government or the state government in particular since we have the honorable minister in his office here to look at with respect to um uh, private uh sellers or private parties i think it's e-commerce or otherwise i think it's very important to break down your overall customer relationship into these buckets of pre transaction at the time of contract formation payment post transaction broad uh, grievance addressal and lastly establishing a bit of a common minimum program on fair business principles uh, which can if you may become codes of ethic or codes of compliance that can actually enthuse confidence with respect to the regulator that this is the common minimum program for a particular sector or region or set of consumers and i think that will go a long way we've already seen uh basic common minimum guidelines or standards being adopted unilaterally by the industry and then being considered by regulators uh and this would provide a fair balance uh with respect to what the act provides as well as the practical nuances of how the act has to be implemented for the states i think it's very very important to uh get our act together and notify all the rules as quickly as possible in that uh and this is a basis experience that i've had working with a couple of states drafting rules and the entire framework for them uh there is a great potential to leverage e filing and hearing there's a great potential to look at data driven approaches the central rules currently provide for capturing uh the case related data in a, in a particular way and basis all of that in adequate time you could even start exploring the possibility of what i would say is the ultimate consumer redressal right which is where the consumer really does not have to go to court or a dispute redressal forum which is looking at concepts around de minimis compensation to take a leaf out of the uh airline sector when the cancellations deferments seat change and all of these items became a big big issue as more and more people uh started taking uh flights and uh you had the regulator come in and set a certain amount of principles with respect to minimum compensation that should be given in certain scenarios and i think all of this data driven approach with leveraging e filing getting all your quality resources from the state uh to to come up at at a state level redressal center is is really going to help in the long run that's all i have in the limited time thank you very much uh back to the moderator please thank you oh thank you mr aditya uh it was a very uh, impactful presentation and uh, plr chambers the initials plr stands for policy law and regulation and the way you went about in your talk offering practical analysis of uh, the act and uh, uh, recollect what you said this act is act to disruptive in nature so on this note uh, got to learn so much uh, from mr aditya i'm sure uh, this must be the observation of every participant in the room thanks much again might grind with wheat likewise of the few who aspire to profit high owing to undesirable and spurious manufacturing or trading 
bring a bad name to the entire fraternity of business ecosystem. To elucidate the liabilities and penalties for such bad fishes, we have a legal leopard on board. I invite Mr. Jia Srikanth, Senior Vice President, Legal, RP Sanjeev Goenka Group. Mr. Srikanth, over to you. Thank you, Moiji, and welcome all participants as well as all my co panelists. Uh, Moiji has already given enough uh, introduction about the consumer, and Adit Mishtaditya has also given the salient feature of that. It's no doubt that consumer is the king and every decision is made around the consumer. Especially in last 20 years, the 50% of Fortune 500 companies are disappeared, vanished from their business. The only reason, the main reason is they could not anticipate the needs and requirements of the consumer. So they, they went ahead with their policies, their practices, which are not accepted by the consumer. And the end consumer has rejected these companies and these companies lost their existence. Remember, these are Fortune 500 companies, 50% of Fortune 500 companies. And companies which understand the needs of the consumer and which take all decisions around the consumer will survive. And we are seeing over the years, some companies run hundreds of years together, irrespective of the environment which they operate. Now, coming to the discussion about the spurious goods, because enough has been talked by my predecessors two speakers about the salient features and authorities under the Act, I'm going to limit my discussion only to the spurious goods and consequences thereof. As we know that this Act, Consumer Protection as Act has given various rights to consumer and to protect them from use of any, from any misuse. So the act stipulates the duties of various stakeholders like manufacturer, distributors, sellers and importers, of course, and also the e-commerce entities. In case of any violation, the act also prescribed serious punishment. If you see section 100 of the act, it says that this act is in addition to the, any other laws. It's not, it's not a derogation. It is in addition to the, any existing laws. So if you have any offenses punishable under IPC, that may be there in addition to that, this also will also be there. Now, the issue of, uh, in case of violation, there's a manufacturer punishment has been prescribed for the various levels. But before coming to that, what are the spurious goods? In, if you remember the old act, old act also defined the spurious goods and it also under unfettered practice, it also described the spurious goods. So the, the, the industry is such a big that $500 billion industry is the spurious goods across the world. This is as per USPT or report. And we, we as a country, India is also figures in the list of one of the largest importers of spurious and counterfeit goods. What happens to this? This is a huge impact on economy as we lost the taxes and someone original owner of the intellectual property rights his property has been infringed and more importantly, the end consumer, it will have a serious effect either on his health or on life. So I was talking to one of the CEO of a premium brand who are the sole and master franchisee for the country uh, in, the, in the apparel sector. So his sales were down, but his products are being seen large across the country. The only reason is what he found is there are a lot of counterfeit either in-house manufactured in the country or it is being illegally smuggled into the country. So what is spurious goods? Spurious goods is the goods which are claimed to be genuine. Like it has the same meaning of the earlier act and the same coverage also be uh, covered under the unfair trade practice. So unfair trade practice, we have a lot of practices has been defined under the current act. But one of the unfair trade practices is manufacturing and sale of spurious goods. What does it mean? Means it's a duplication of original products. In simple English, it's a manufacturing of identical products. We, we were seeing a lot of advertisements calling the first copy, second copy, or a replica, a relica. All these are mislabeled products. Of course, 
the word counterfeit has not been used in act but it covers the it's and the, the spurious goods define the broad it's very broad the simple thing is whatever we are even claiming to be genuine and if it is not a genuine it's a spurious goods so it includes all your counterfeit also coming to the penalties the current act consumer protection act 2019 chapter 8 deals with the offenses the penalty is raised from 8 section 88 to the 90 Three, but we limit our discussion only to the extent of spurious goods, where it is covered. It is covered under Section ninety one. Remember, if you go back to the IPC under IPC four eighty six, there is a punishment for counterfeit use of counterfeit goods, either manufacture or sale of counterfeit goods, and the penalty there is uh, up to ten thousand rupees or imprisonment up to period of one year. here as consumer protection act the the punishment is much bigger than what it prescribed or described in the ipc what it says here if any person got any consumer who got injured on account of usage of any spurious good and this injury is not a grievous act it's a simple injury then in that case the punishment is one year and the penalty is up to rupees 3 lakhs suppose if he used the spurious goods and he got an injury and injury is grievous then the penalty may extend up to period of 7 years similarly the fine will also increase from 3 lakhs to 5 years god forbid in case of death the punishment is between minimum 7 years and maximum life so this is a stringent punishment and in addition to that the penalty is 10 lakhs is not these offenses are cognizable offense and non bailable as we all know that cognizable offenses the police officer has the authority to make an arrest without warrant and he can start investigation without any permission of the court so as my earlier speakers what they did more mentioned about the authorities so one of the authorities district collector we all know the district collector is executive magistrate of the district so he can exercise the force upon receipt of a complaint from central authority or upon receipt from a state council or upon receipt of information from any functionary which constituted under the act so he can direct the police to conduct the investigation and he can do it suppose as i earlier said that this is in addition to the existing uh, laws so in case if this product happens to be a food product you know under food product prevention of uh, under food safety and standards act you have various kinds of offenses one is misbranding where the where the product has been described as falsely when you have a substandard where you have a unsafe food so all these punishments run concurrently in addition to this whatever it is mentioned in other laws similarly very recently we also know that this e-commerce rules has been notified again in some draft notification also being under discussion uh, so the e-commerce entities also been given some kind of responsibility and some kinds of duties and they need to exercise the due diligence in order to avoid unfair trade practices unfair trade practices again we need to go back to the definition of spurious goods so in case of marketplace e-commerce marketplace e-commerce was typically hold the platform where various sellers will uh, uplist or enlist on their product these marketplace e-commerce they shall require to obtain an undertaking from all the sellers stating that the images described are accurate and corresponded directly with the appearance and nature of quality of goods there are lot of complaints earlier with the uh, uh, central authority saying that they advertise one product they have received one product so all these will come under going forward will come under the definition of spurious goods suppose if any complaint has come regarding the spurious goods or counterfeit goods then the seller listed on the marketplace shall take back the goods immediately and withdraw and discontinue the goods if such goods are uh, if the customer demand that refund uh, back whatever the amount is paid then yeah the seller has to honor that there are two kinds before this we we also need to understand there are two kinds of 
spurious goods available in the market one is the person himself has declared that these are not original goods because these are non deceptive tactics where the seller upfront makes an intimation because you might have all seen on the various website that are in the uh, in any mode of the offline online wherever a premium luxury pen with average cost around 30000 or 40000 you'll get it for 300 or 400 even for 500 rupees so when the vendor itself is declared that these are deceptive these are not original these are the first copy second copy these cases also covered under this period the definition of spurious goods and the punishment will also come under section 99 whereas the owner anyway he has the natural right of invoking the provisions of intellectual property be it trademark or what being copyright there are other other products which the vendors sellers manufacturers they adapt a deceptive tactics where they make believe the consumer that they intentionally make the product that these are the original products and they promote that they sell so going forward this this kind of issues will ramp up similarly as we are getting everyone is going on a, all modes of because consumption is very high so the the chances are very high because as i said this industry is 500 billion dollars as per uspt report and we it's it's a cagr about 20% having said this whether we can tackle this yes no doubt it's a big challenge but going forward one is deterrent measures and second as mohit ji already said about the uh, machine learning and ai that technology has the answers so some companies uh, you they are using blockchain technology especially in food supply uh, food supply food ecosystem so what this technology is these uh, trace and locate every phase of the product right from the farm to fork the manufacturing a storage distribution selling the if the consumer scan it then he can identify whether this is came through the authorized system or not uh, in india also a couple of states they adapted this technology in especially on distribution of liquor where governments do because in liquor industry there are lot of spurious goods and why they make is because to avoid the excise duty which amounts to 50 to 60% of the cost of the product so going forward these technologies will come and in fact this there is an app called smart consumer of ministry of consumer affairs where we can scan any product by barcode then it will show you the details the batch number date of batch number and other manufacturing details etc but that is only a static information but technology will come technology will develop which can identify the product enter flow of the product from production to consume conception it is going to be coming very shortly and some people are already using this where if we scan the product then we we'll know the life cycle of the product so with this going forward this is very big challenge and uh, uh, the new act which has been given certain duties for the manufacturers sellers as well as other stakeholders so the provisions is very much in the interest of the consumer and which can deter the people who are indulging uh, theft of intellectual property and playing the with the lives of the consumers so with this mohit ji thank you so much uh, uh, aapne to aankhe khol di uh, jali अवैध नकली माल का धंधा इस देश में सैकड़ों करोड़ रुपए का होता है और जागो ग्राहक जागो आपका फर्ज बनता है कि आप अवगत करवाएं जहां पर भी ऐसी प्रैक्टिसेस चल रही हैं सो इट वाज एन आई ओपनर गोइंग फर्दर नेक्स्ट एन एजेंसी ऑफ विच द जस्टिस फ्लोज टू वेयर वी रिसोर्ट सी डी आर सी कंज्यूमर डिस्प्यूट रिडर्सल कमीशन a product of delhi university and an authority in his arena mr surinder sharma whole time director vp colgate palmolive india limited shall guide us uh, as to how we go about the complaints and mediation in the interest of time mr sharma we have to keep it really short uh, thank you over to mr sharma thank you mohit ji and don't worry i'll be very very short and specific uh, uh, so uh, thank you uh, so much uh, the the 
the dignitaries from Fiki, Fiki Maharashtra, Deepak Ji, uh, Neena Ji from Fiki Delhi, and my fellow co panelists and and uh, uh, your participants. Feeling privileged to be part of this uh, distinguished panel, and would like to thank uh, Fiki for this opportunity of participating in this knowledge sharing session on on Consumer Protection Act. So as as uh, Mohit has uh, suggested, I'll be speaking on complaints and mediation under the Act. But before I start, as as my uh, my uh, uh, co-panelist Mr. Shikant also talked about uh, the one distinguishing factor or the differentiating factor between a successful company and not so successful company, I think that is uh, he, he mentioned it about the consumer centricity or the consumer focus. So those companies who have kept the consumers at center of their focus, they have consistently, uh, uh, you know. Performed, they have come, uh, they have they have uh, able to overcome all the challenges, whether it is economic downturn or it's a competition intensity or or any type of challenges. They they come out winning. They are able to overcome purely because of uh, keeping the consumer as a center of their focus. So I am in fact uh, proud to say that I work for one one of those companies, Colgate Palmolive India, which has kept the consumer as center of their focus always. Uh, and then providing best in class oral care products for more than eight decades now. So, uh, uh, and, 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 and frankly speaking, consumers of these companies will not require to invoke the provisions which I am going to talk about uh, 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 relating to filing of complaints and, and, uh, and, and mediation process. Having said that, let me now uh, present my screen uh, to share some uh, couple of slides to you all. I hope you are able to share, uh, see my screen. Yes. Yes, yes. So, uh, as Mr. Aditya has talked about consumer rights uh, in, in detail, uh, whenever a consumer uh, feels that his right is being infringed or his right is getting uh, uh, impacted by any companies or he's being taken for granted, uh, where he can go, where he can file the complaints. I think it has been touched by my other uh, fellow panelists also that authorities, uh, which has been, uh, they've spoken about uh, central consumer protection authorities at a central level. Then uh, there is a regional office and uh, at a state level and at a district level, each district has a district council where district collector is the in charge. So these are the three authorities uh, where a consumer can file a complaint under section 17. Or in alternative, uh, uh, if they want to file a, a, a quasi judicial proceedings before uh, Consumer Dispute Redressal Commission, they can file a complaint there. Now, what the Act has provided, they have uh, set up uh, a district uh, CDRCs at a district level, state level, and a national level. Of course, these are all part of our previous acts also. Uh, except the fact that their jurisdiction has been increased now from the, the, the pecuniary jurisdiction in terms of the amount of claims uh, they can entertain. So now uh, the, the revised limit at a district level is uh, a claim or uh, complaints uh, uh, up to a one crore claim can be entertained at a district level uh, a consumer dispute redressal commission, CDRC. Uh, from one crore to 10 crore, a consumer can file a complaint straight away to uh, a state level, uh, state district, uh, a state uh, dispute redressal commission. And beyond 10 crore, uh, a consumer can file a complaint directly at the national commission. So uh, now coming back to the, the complaint, filed with uh, uh, the, the central authorities. Uh, now, uh, as mentioned by uh, Madam Nishat also, uh, CDRC, CDRC, when they feel the complaint is filed with them and they feel that prima facie uh, there is a violation of a consumer right, uh, uh, but they don't, they want to invest, get it investigated, they can, by an order, ask the, the DC, uh, the Director General of Investigation to, to um, or, or, or a district collector to, to make further investigation before they pass an order. And, or in alternative, what they can do is they can also refer the matter uh, to a concerned regulator. For example, uh, in various industries has a separate regulator. Uh, I'll give you an example of an insurance uh, which is being regulated by IRIDA or, or electricity services where uh, 
uh, uh, they they are also uh, sep- uh, governed by a separate regulator. So these kind of where a separate regulator exists, they can uh, refer the matter to their concerned regulator to look into these kind of complaints rather than they looking into the complaint. And 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 once the the investigation is complete uh, by by DGIR uh, director general of investigation, uh, they they uh, the central authority uh, can pass an order. And as part of that order, they can either uh, pass the order for recall of goods. If there is a defect in the uh, goods, they can uh, order for a withdrawal of services. Uh, in, in, in those situations where either goods or services are dangerous, unsafe, or hazardous, they can also order for reimbursement of prices, as mentioned earlier. Or they can simply ask the, uh, the companies to discontinue that unfair trade practices if it is a case of uh, unfair trade practice by the company. Uh, any any company which feels aggrieved by the order of uh, uh, central authority, they have right to challenge that order against national commission, uh, uh, against that order uh, uh, by filing and appealing the national commission. Uh, but that's uh, again uh, only if they are aggrieved by the order. Now coming to the, the the process which is adopted by consumer dispute redress commission, uh, this is. This has been the process uh, uh, always, uh, even in the previous act, as mentioned. Uh, the previous act of 1986 also, uh, they, they, it was amended and there was an admission of the complaint. That the quite distinguishing factor in the new act is, is a reference to mediation, which I'll be talking in detail in my next slide, and which is the, uh, the center point and which was not part of the earlier act. So, so even the, the regulator now, recognize the power of mediation and the things it can be uh, through mutual discussion uh, between the parties. So so now uh, after admission of uh, a particular complaint, CDRC, if they feel that there is a mediation, I'll speak to you about the mediation in my subsequent slide and not talking about it now, but the further process is uh, is, is a usual process where a copy of complaint is served on the opposite party. They reply, and uh, uh, in case there is a particular product which requires an analysis by an appropriate laboratory, uh, the CDRC can refer the sample to that appropriate laboratory and uh, post that basis the evidence. They they will pass an order. So this is broadly the the process uh, which is adopted by all the consumer dispute resolution commission. Uh, coming to the mediation, so as, as I mentioned that if uh, a CDRC at the first instance after the admission, they feel that there is a scope where a matter can be sorted out and then parties are also willing, uh, they uh, refer the matter to mediation uh, uh, after obtaining the consent of the parties in writing. Uh, uh, every Under the law, uh, you know, it, the, the each, uh, you know, district, uh, uh, commission, this district council or state council or central council, they are all supposed to set up these mediation cells, uh, which are attached to uh, the respective uh, uh, commission. Uh, these uh, 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 mediation cells also need to panel the mediators uh, and the, the, the guidelines provided under the Act. And, and even all those uh, uh, mediators which are impaneled. And when they are handling any matter which are being referred by the CDRC, they need to, uh, you know, before before they start handling that mediation, they need to uh, disclose their interest uh, in, in a particular matter, whether they are they have any conflict of interest or not. And then uh, the procedure is again, it, it is quite informal in nature, but there are certain guiding principles which a mediator needs to follow. Uh, and and, and, and the, one of the main guiding principles is follow the principle of natural justice, where each party, uh, both the sides should be given the opportunity of being heard. Uh, they need to present their case. And, and only when uh, but, uh, each of them has been uh, offered the opportunity of being heard, uh, the mediator, uh, uh, he, 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 he records the, the settlements and he, he uh, prepares his report. So uh, post this, uh, uh, following all this process, if there is a settlement which, which is... Uh, agreed to by both the sides that settlements needs to be uh, put up in writing and signed by both the parties 
and it needs to be forwarded by the, the big data to the uh, respective CDRC uh, for taking it on record. So once the, the report of mediation is uh, comes to the respective CDRC, they take it on record and accordingly pass the final order and, and dispose of the respective consumer complaints. So that's broadly the, the, uh, the mediation process and is quite remarkable uh, uh, way it has been introduced. I, 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 I think the parties can make use of this particular mediation. It's quite cost effective, uh, quite fast. And and, uh, and and both the sites need not enter into uh, the the the, uh, the complex uh, litigation process, uh, which is normally uh, uh, one has to follow uh, by by engaging a lawyer and 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 filing a different uh, legal process and legal documents. So that's it from my side. Uh, but happy to answer any questions if there are any post the session uh, from any of the. Uh, participants thank you uh thank you sir that was incredible bahut kuch janne ko mila uh now this act places the consumer as the king i request mr nishan shah senior partner economic law specialist to jump in to shed some light on this kingship and how these kings these consumers are shielded against harm arising out of any mark connection in the direct selling space or e-commerce sector. But before I have you, uh, now both these retail formats, uh, e-commerce and direct selling emerged in India in the recent two decades. While e-commerce as such is a common knowledge, let me briefly touch on what is direct selling. Uh, direct selling means marketing, distribution and sale of goods or provision of services through a network of sellers other than through a permanent retail location. And as a co-chair direct selling task force committee and founding member of FDSA, I extend my heartfelt thanks to government of Maharashtra to have issued guidelines for regulating the business of direct selling also called multi-level marketing MLM and strengthening the existing regulatory mechanism in the Maharashtra state for preventing the fraud and protection of the rights and interest of consumers. Uh, over to Mr. Shah to take it forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Sadana. And I think rightly mentioned by you, uh, uh, direct selling and e-commerce have been the recent uh, introductions in the marketing chain. Uh, in fact, uh, so let me not take too much time. I'm aware of the fact that we are running against time. And while my team has uh, worked to put in a presentation together, uh, I'm trying to, I'll try to skip as many slides as possible. <laughs> they've out of their excitement for the legislation and the innovation in the legislation, they've put together a few slides, but I'm going to try to skip whatever slides and uh, stick to some of the basics and more critical aspects of the uh, presentation. Uh, so on the consumer protection law, you know, there was a need to bring in the consumer protection act 2019. Why was there a need? Because you had the consumer protection act of 86. Uh, in fact, like Mr. Sadhana mentioned right at the start, that consumer protection related provisions have been existing in Indian legislations right from the Atharva Veda, as he had mentioned. In fact, if you see the Chanakya Niti or if you see the Manusmriti also, it has certain provisions which deal with this aspect. Uh, in fact, prior to the introduction, the introduction of Consumer Protection Act 86 was an organized legislation focused towards consumer protection. But if you see the Contract Act of 1872, or the sale of goods act all have provisions relating to consumer protection but there was a need for a focused legislation addressed or addressing consumer protection or the rights of consumers even the 86 act it was felt was getting outdated and therefore there was the need for the consumer protection act of 2019 and if you see the object of the statute when it was announced and this was put before the parliament and i'll just read one sentence out of that it says it replaced the three decade archaic law which is the 86 act to encompass modern and contemporary modes of conducting business, which inter alia includes providing goods and services via online sales or e-commerce, direct selling, multi-level marketing, tele-shopping, etc. Exactly the words that uh, Mr. Sadana mentioned that, you know, these are the new systems and the new technology in marketing and selling. And therefore, there was a need for the 2019 Act. Now, the 2019 Act under Section 94, read with Section 101, uh, subsection 2 clause ZG gives powers to the central government to come out with certain uh, regulations, rules in relation to e-commerce and direct selling. Uh, 
like uh, Mr. Sadar mentioned, the Maharashtra government has already uh, issued certain guidelines for direct selling, and uh, and they've also nomenclatured the multi-level marketing. Uh, the central rules, uh, the draft rules were in, announced sometime in the uh, November of 2019. However, those rules also now have been shifted to the archive section of the website of uh, the uh, Ministry of Consumer Affairs. Uh, but there are certain factors of that which I thought we should just touch upon that what is direct selling? Direct selling has been defined under the Consumer Protection Act as well to mean marketing, distribution or sale of goods or provision of services through a network of sellers other than under a pyramid scheme. Pyramid scheme has been prohibited. It cannot be operated. Pyramid scheme is a scheme where you have multiple layers of uh, uh, uh sellers who are there and subscribers who are there which has not been uh, permitted under the draft rules the draft rules are yet to be uh, uh, notified and uh, who undertakes sales without a permanent retail location they have also undergone to take a definition of direct selling entity and a direct seller a direct selling entity is one who appoints direct sellers to undertake the sale and direct seller is one who will undertake the direct selling as we've seen the definition. Now, the important point is that even between the direct seller and the direct selling entity, it is a P2P transaction, which means that the direct seller is selling on his own account now to the consumer. And therefore, it is very important to regulate the behavior and actions of the direct seller also as he sells to the consumer. So therefore, what do these rules prescribe? These rules prescribe two levels of uh, transactions the transactions between the direct selling entity and the direct seller, how it should be regulated, and that between the direct seller and the consumers. And let's touch upon that in a very brief manner. Uh, the draft rules list conditions for setting up of the direct selling entity, which setting up also includes the registration, orientation, remuneration. So, you know, there is a registration now required with the DPIIT. Uh, with the Ministry of uh, the Department of Consumer Affairs, uh, there is the uh, orientation uh, which is required to be carried out by the direct selling entity of the direct sellers. Uh, the remuneration for the direct sellers, there should be a refund mechanism where the direct sellers cannot sell it further and want to return the goods back. Or how is the conduct of the uh, uh, operations, the conduct of the operation also that they should be, the direct selling entity should be the holder of the, uh, of the patent or the uh, right in the, uh, uh, the trademark in the goods being sold he should maintain the website maintain certain records and obviously operate ethically that is not misguide or mislead uh, the rules also go into describing the various uh, aspects which should be there in the contractual arrangement between the uh, direct selling entity and the direct seller and it says that you know the direct selling entity cannot compel the direct seller to procure a certain quantum of goods if the goods are not sold there should be a facility to return the goods there should be a facility to terminate the contract between the direct selling entity and the direct seller so there are provisions which regulate between the direct selling entity and the direct seller for the goods to be for ultimately supplied to consumer it also very clearly gives the obligation of the direct selling entity that how uh, it cannot be misleading the uh, misleading the consumer or misrepresenting the goods and things. So all in all, if you see, there are these provisions which have been brought in, which provisions go to protect the consumer from any sort of fraud being conducted against them, should there be any uh, misrepresentation or misleading uh, 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 facts which are provided to them. Also, it goes to define the scope of the direct sellers and what will be the obligation of the direct seller, how they will operate, how they will uh, uh, interact with the consumers. And therefore, it's a holistic legislation which has been brought in place to regulate a direct selling process and which is a new phenomena within the marketing regime itself. As uh, Mr. Sadan also mentioned, it's just over the last two decades that these concepts have been introduced and the practices have been put in play. But a welcome move. To bring in a regulation, we are awaiting when the final regulations will be, uh, uh, hopefully the final rules will be put to public comments and thereafter notified by the government. But till then, we have to wait as to what are the uh, rules which are coming about on that. Uh, moving from direct selling, the other part of my uh, talk today is the e-commerce, which has become significantly prevalent and especially in today's times of lockdown, the significance of an e-commerce activity has uh, significantly enhanced. And therefore, there was very much a need for some sort of regulations to regulate the uh, or to protect the consumer from the e-commerce entities that are uh, providing goods through electronic channels. And uh, so we had the e-commerce rules which got pronounced. These got pronounced on the 23rd of July 2020. The e-commerce rules intend to cover such e-commerce entities, Indian and foreign, who own, operate or manage digital or 
digital or electronic facility or platform for electronic commerce now it covers both indian and foreign e-commerce operators so foreign commerce operators also that means those who are not based in india but who systematically supply goods or uh, offer goods or services to indian uh, people then they will also be covered within this and who are offering these goods or uh, etc through sellers from their e-commerce platform what is important is these rules again go to regulate that what will be applicable to a direct uh, to a e-commerce operator so all goods or services brought or sold over digital or electronic network including digital products so not just goods or services that you buy but also digital uh, mechanism methods which are sent through the internet all models of e-commerce including marketplace inventory model of e-commerce all e-commerce retail including multi channel and uh, single brand retailers or single brand retailers in single or multi format so what is important is that there are two types of platforms as most of us here are aware that there is a uh, inventory based uh, marketplace or there is an in, uh, either there is a marketplace model or there is an inventory based model so both of these are covered and all forms of unfair trade practices in relation to models of e-commerce will also be regulated under this so that's the uh, scope of this there are a few concepts about e-commerce i don't need to get into that just briefly to explain it is to cover those activities which are through e-commerce and like uh, i think my co speaker uh, aditya also mentioned that the expanse is quite wide because today it's not just the uh, significant uh, apps or the websites that you have which are e-commerce operators there are also individual brands who are e-commerce operators there are individual traders who are e-commerce operators and all of those who fall into that so since the expanse is so wide it is important to understand who would be covered within the e-commerce entity and what are the duties so these legislation also brings in the duties of the e-commerce entity i don't intend to run through all the duties uh, since it's an elaborate but it's there on the uh, screen for anyone to know let me just highlight a couple of them which are important there is a duty of the e-commerce operator which has been put under put under the legislation to say that they shall not impose cancellation charges on consumers cancelling after the purchase that means if there is any transaction which you have undertaken and there is a they are cancelling and then they say that okay there will be some cancellation charges that is not permitted unless if it is corollary that means the supplier also says that if i am also not able to supply to you i will pay you some compensation in which case then they can charge cancellation charges now these are unique provisions i don't know how many of us are aware how much it but there are these provisions which are there in the legislation uh, lastly there is also i'll just take the last one one more shall not discriminate between consumers of the same class or make any arbitrary classification of consumers now we have you know on certain uh, e-commerce platforms or marketplaces that certain customer is a prime customer or a premium customer and how does that implicate so that customer by giving the prime or premium they are not distinguishing the class it is not the same class anymore in which case then they can make certain differentiation discrimination so that is possible but if it's the same class you cannot make again the discrimination is not arbitrary if it is because somebody has paid some amount and become a prime customer you can make a differentiation so there are laws there are systems that are being adopted and the systems are being adopted in a manner such that the law is not being broken so what is important to understand that what are the legislation and what are the changes which are being brought in like i mentioned there are two types of models under e-commerce the marketplace and the inventory model the duties as i have shown on the screen are similar for both the models except that in case of inventory model since the inventory holder the e-commerce uh, platform holder is also the seller on that even the seller related duties come in so what are the seller related duties very briefly seller related duties no seller offering goods through a marketplace e-commerce shall undertake any unfair practices etc these are definitions uh, in fact my co speakers have already touched upon what is unfair trade practice Uh, falsely represent itself as a consumer and put wrong reviews of the goods etc or when we see from the positive side that you know the seller offering this goods or uh, through a marketplace entity shall have a prior written contract with the e-commerce entity as to what the structure is appoint a grievance officer that's a necessary and that's a compulsion also he'll have to provide such details of the product to the e-commerce entity for the e-commerce entity to put it up on the website or on the app such that it facilitates the consumer as regards pre purchase stage decision making now even though these legislations were existing and all of these provisions were existing which we discussed that you know it's a new stream which has come through and there was there was a need of consumer protection act of 2019 
even this even these rules the e-commerce rules are subject to amendment which are on the envelope of amendment and why the amendment is required the press release by the government of india says that there have been a significant number of cheating cases which have been registered on e-commerce activities that to protect the interest of the consumers and encourage free and fair competition in the market and to have enough transparency between the consumer who's buying on the platform there was a need for for certain changes a whole bunch of changes are being brought in i will just harp on two or three of those but rather i will harp on the background why were these changes required very recently in the december of 2020 the eu has brought in two significant changes to regulate all e-commerce activities it is the digital services act and the uh, and one more digital act in relation to regulating of services the us has strengthened its antitrust laws which large platforms were misusing by becoming dominant powers with eu us taking certain steps india could not have been behind india is now upgrading its legislation to bring it in par with the global best practices the global best legislation so even for e-commerce operators there are specific provisions being brought in they will be required to register with the dpiit uh, they will not be able to provide any misleading advertisement misleading advertisement again is a new concept introduced under the uh, uh, under the uh, consumer protection law under the new consumer protection law so various amendments being brought in the two or three very significant ones which have been become a talking point also and a point of deliberation is that e-commerce operators will not be allowed to organize flash sales flash sales we've been seeing that you know all of a sudden you'll have a large newspaper advertisement that on certain product a significant amount of discount is being given for the next three days on a certain website or a certain app and a lot of people will be pulled in into that to examine that those kind of activities have been considered to be detrimental as uh, these have been resulting into shift of uh, focus and the shift of transition of the documents etc second there are specific rules being brought in for dominant positions or a website which is having a dominant position and dominant position is defined under the competition act will have to be trading in a certain manner which is uh, uh, which is not derogatory to the customer consumer interest and lastly a very important point any data collected vis-a-vis -vis the activity of the consumer on the website cannot be used by an e-commerce website without the written consent of the consumer a very important point at times you'll see that they have this cross selling concept that you buy a product immediately two other products pop up that popping up of the two other products is in a way cross selling that because you bought this one product immediately information goes to the other seller that okay this person has bought this product he would also be interested in this other product the other product pops up now this popping up is based on your information being communicated can such information be communicated there are regulations now under this new legislation the amendment which is being brought in to restrain or curtail this kind of cross selling unless with the written or the specific permission of the uh, consumer i know i'm running short of time uh, i have uh, tried to expedite as much as possible uh, this is on specific aspects of uh, the uh, e-commerce and direct selling uh, as I mentioned at the initial part of my presentation that the need for the 2019 legislation in a way was the coming into existence of the new technologies, the new marketing mechanisms, the new systems, and therefore the new law. With the new law, the new rules, and even the new rules are now archaic, therefore amendments to the new rules. Uh, with that, I'll uh, conclude my presentation and uh, happy to take any questions that uh, uh, the participants may have. But before I conclude, uh, let me not uh, miss the opportunity of thanking Fiki for giving me this opportunity of uh, presenting and uh, thank you my co-speakers as well as uh, Mr. Sadana for uh, hosting this uh, session. Thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Shah. Uh, so does that mean that this year, 15 August, uh, ki jo flash sale last year enjoy kiya hamare bahut se grahakon ne, teen din tak likha rehta tha, 50% of is marketplace par wo is par nahi hoga. So I do not know how will the consumer uh, perceive of this uh, new law. So thank you, Mr. Shah, yet again. Uh, I believe, uh, uh, first of all, uh, let me seek permission from uh, my colleagues Deepak ji and Lina ji. Uh, ki maybe stretch this session by 15 more minutes because uh, our audience abhi tak actively bana hua hai and unhi ke liye ye webinar humne host kiya. So I seek your permission to stretch the session and I request the panelists to stay back for a few more minutes for Q&A round. And uh, meanwhile, uh, uh, I also request my panelists to switch on their uh, video so that we can click a photo for the phone memories. Uh, 
I believe uh, that with such detailed discussion on CPA 2019, our audience has gained immensely and the webinar has done justice to the title it has. Still, if someone is brimming with doubts to gain further clarity on the CPA 2019, I invite subject related questions. Please feel free. Uh, Samir ji, uh, please check on the other platform, YouTube, jahan par bahut se hamare participants hain. Wahan par comment section mein ya chat box mein agar koi sawal ho, to hum yahan par rakh sakte hain. I request the panelists to stay with us for a few more minutes as your answers to the questions will clear ambiguities in many minds. Mohit ji, someone has asked uh, the question, very relevant question of where is the chief guest and I would like to apologize, uh, you know, on behalf of Vicky. Uh, actually, um, he's still in our meeting. There's some last minute meeting which has come up on the election. And for last two hours, we have been in touch with his office and he's just not able to come out of it. In fact, uh, uh, on a con I mean, to a surprising note, this event's first confirmed speaker was the Honorable Minister, which actually happens otherwise. The ministers are always the last one to confirm. But this was the this was the the uh, you know program where honourable minister confirmed first and then rest of these speakers. So our sincere apologies uh, for that. And uh, I've been told that he's there till till at least one uh, you know uh, p.m. He's busy in his meeting, uh, and and hence we doubt that he will be able to accommodate now because we have already overshot the time. Uh, but we would still be. But I think. Uh, we should not discount the time which the uh, you know all the panelists have given to us presentation and inputs and if audience has any time uh, any question do do ask us i see a lot of comments a lot of comments but these are only positive comments on youtube about the, the great presentations done by the uh, by the uh, the panelists out here uh, so so if still someone has some question, please, uh, you know, do ask. We can maybe have another five minutes, uh, uh, you know, to, to take a question. You can raise your hand uh, who are in Zoom platform also. We will unmute you and, and allow you to ask uh, the, the question. Mr. Jasori, uh, I, I have can I Deepak, can you hear me? Yes, please. Yeah, so there was this one question uh, which was there on the chat box. Is there any kind of punishment for celebrities endorsing products related to misleading advertisements both for online and offline sales? Is the question uh, that needs to be answered. Anyone of the panelists can take this. I'll take this. Section 21 clearly specifies the li liability on the endorser. Uh, then central authority has the power in case of any misleading advertisement or advertisement which far from truth, they have the power to impose penalty on endorser up to 10 lakhs. Okay. In case it's a second and subsequent offense, then it may penalty may extend up to 50 lakhs. However, there is also provision that if the endorser has taken proper due diligence in promoting the brand or acting in the film, food, ad, whatever it is, and he has taken diligence and he has based on the opinion of someone else and he has acted upon, then he can be condoned. Otherwise, there is a penalty up to 10 lakh rupees. There is a question on insurance policy where the online selling of policies, health or term plan is also covered under CPA. Yeah. Uh, happy to take that question, uh, yeah. but uh, so the answer is yes. Uh, in fact, uh, the CPA now expands to not just goods, services and products. And therefore the product has been also were defined as a combination. And even if it's supplied as an online uh, facilitation or an online policy, it will be covered under CPA. Okay. Uh, there is a question by Rohini. Um... Uh, can online marketplace be made party to consumer litigation where the dispute is due to deficiency of service by the end service provider? Uh, so very good question. In fact, uh, the current legislation and the amendment are both trying to address that. So the current uh, position is that the online marketplace is supposed to have uh, 
is equally responsible for the seller selling on their marketplace though the seller is directly responsible for the product which is being supplied the amended provision which is intended to be brought in is directly making the online uh, marketplace responsible for the sales made by the seller so to specifically answer today uh, if the uh, the concern or the grievance is arising no, because of the product is not it is coming, not coming. To be he's occupied with the meeting but uh, if the uh, 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 if the issue is resulting resulting on account of something described on the e-commerce website uh, then or the e-commerce platform then the e-commerce uh, platform can also be pulled in into the complaint but going forward the amendment which is being brought in is intended to be covering both the aspects okay um there is also this other question by prakash kumar some unscrupulous um, customer just for the sake of money uh, has Harris by filing frivolous complaint against FBO, is there a remedy against that? I'll take that question. In the respective, I mean, uh, FSSCI provides for filing frivolous complaints. An action can be taken against that uh, that that uh, customer who is trying to take benefit of it. Uh, the, he, he can be penalized by by the food authorities if if they come out. Uh, to that, you know, if the complaint is frivolous. Okay. Uh, this other question is: What's the punishment if the distributors are caught involving in undercutting, poaching, and working on minimum guarantee malpractices? Anyone can take that question. Uh, the these new terms are uh, now popular in the direct selling space. Uh, minimum <laughs> guarantee and all that stuff. Yeah. So uh, happy to take that uh, question also. Uh, so uh, like uh, Mr. Sadan also mentioned that these are terms which are uh, and these are certain activities. So under the draft uh, direct selling rules which are existing, uh, there is a provision, uh, there is in fact a specific provision which obligates the direct sellers to act in a certain manner. And uh, in those situations, a lot of uh, parameters have been put in. Uh, identifying the ethical uh, that you know all these activities are carried out ethically and in an appropriate manner so within that if there is any uh, aspect where the direct seller can be considered as having not acted in appropriate manner there could be a, a penal consequence of having acted in this manner i don't know whether anyone would like to take this what is the scope of law for digital influencer I don't think it will cover under Consumer Protection Act, but it will certainly cover under the intermediary rules. Very recently, they, uh, from 25th of May or 26th of May, the new rules has come where the social media, where the influencers, especially the influencer, those who are using digital media, has to follow some ethics. It will cover there, but not under uh, Consumer Protection Act. Yeah. Just to build on that, uh, the, the, the self-regulatory body called Advertising Standard Council of India, they have also come out with, uh, uh, with, with rules uh, uh, regulating the influencers. Of course, uh, this is uh, not a law, but these are the guidelines. Uh, and, and, and all the members of Advertising Standard Council of India, we call it ASCII, they need to follow those rules in any case. So... And most of the, the FMCG companies are members of SP, so they are bound by those rules and regulations. Also, there will be self-regulating bodies which will be formed now. Uh, so uh, the BCCC is making one body and there's the IMEI which is making a self-regulatory body. So most of the complaints can go there as well. Uh, I have a question here. All, you are, all of you are law experts. To what extent uh, do the organizations like FDS and IDSA, uh, which are in two sense self-regulatory bodies for the debt selling space, have a role to play? Mr. Mishant, uh, you can take this. Sorry, I am a little, uh, I, I missed the question initially. There was some, this thing. you said the, which bodies? Uh, IDSA and FDSA, Moiji are uh, associations, which are sectoral associations. Uh, they are not self-regulatory bodies unless you have a self-regulatory uh, code that is drawn up and uh, presented to the government. 
Okay. So that's my take on it. Otherwise, you know, as Fiki, we would also call call ourselves a, a self-regulatory body for most of the sectors, but we can't do that. We are associations or chambers representing the industry's point of view. I think you have the answer there. So, uh, Lina ji, should we take more questions? There are a few, but otherwise we'll answer them. Uh, we'll send it to the panelists and also answer them. That's not a problem. If you want to close now, it's, uh, yeah, okay. So uh, with such elaborate understanding on the CPA 2019, now I believe hundreds of consumers who participated today have become aware consumers. Allow me to briefly touch upon something we call conscious consumerism, sometimes called ethical or green consumerism means consumers deliberately making purchasing decisions that they understand have a positive social, economic, and environmental impact. So on a very personal note, addressing the aware consumers you have become now, we should be uh, conscious consumers as well. Also, we today have many entrepreneurs participating in the webinar. With the way this pandemic is playing out, the times are challenging. Rebuilding the nation asks for India to become much more pro-business than ever before. I'm proud to share FIKI maintains the lead as the active business solution provider through research interactions at the highest political level and global networking. Success of a nation depends largely upon its commerce and businesses. Sirf dhai tinsho saal pehle ki baat hai, we were the largest economy on the planet, biggest exporter on the planet, and we enjoyed the status, this status for thousands of years. Let's live our swadharma as entrepreneur and reclaim the same glory and let's rebuild Bharat. I would wind up thanking on behalf of Fiki, uh, all the panelists who joined us today, uh, Madam Huck for sparing her valuable time, all the lawyers, all the eminent lawyers, young entrepreneurs, direct sellers, my colleagues from Fiki. Thank you, Deepak sir. Thank you, Lina madam. My colleagues from IDSA, from FDSA, and to all the esteemed panelists once again. Uh, gratitude for the chairperson, uh, Fiki Maharashtra, for having made this event possible. Uh, uh, anyways, thanks to the minister's office for at least considering uh, us to be the part of, uh, and uh, office bearers of the Excelling Task Force Committee, Team Swadharma for making such a large audience and supporting the event. Uh, uh, big thanks to one and all once again for all the support. And uh, yes, uh, thanks to Samir for assisting me making this webinar super successful. I believe it is successful. Uh, Jai Hind. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank thank you. Thank thank you, everyone. you Mohit ji for uh, very eloquently, you know, sort of moderating the session. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you, everyone.